Before we get into today's episode, I want to let you know about a source of powerful free resources to help you as a parent or grandparent get equipped to invest in the faith of the next generation. Our Next Gen website has been designed to help empower you to navigate tough issues with the young people in your life. At NextGen, you'll find articles, entertainment reviews from a Christian perspective, parenting stories, helpful parenting guides, and even answers to the tough questions. All these resources are free as you engage on the front line of raising the next generation for Jesus. So why not register today at premierinsight.org forward slash resources to receive free resources from NextGen. That's premierinsight.org forward slash resources. And now it's time for today's podcast. Bringing the Word to Life, the Bible in a Year. The second book of Samuel, chapters 23 and 24. These are the last words of David, the oracle of David, son of Jesse, the oracle of the man exalted by the Most High, the man anointed by the God of Jacob, Israel's singer of songs. The Spirit of the Lord spoke through me, His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, When one rules over men in righteousness, when he rules in the fear of God, he is like the light of morning at sunrise, on a cloudless morning, like the brightness after rain that brings the grass from the earth. Is not my house right with God? Has he not made with me an everlasting covenant? arranged and secure in every part. Will he not bring to fruition my salvation and grant me my every desire? But evil men are all to be cast aside like thorns, which are not gathered with the hand. Whoever touches thorns uses a tool of iron or the shaft of a spear. They are burned up where they lie. These are the names of David's mighty men, Joshep bath the Tachamite, the chief of the three. He raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. Next to him was Eleazar, son of Dodai the Ahohite. As one of the three mighty men, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Bath-Stamin for battle. Then, the men of Israel retreated, but he stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. Next to him was Shammah, son of Aji the Hararite. When the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them. Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. During harvest time, three of the thirty chief men came down to David at the cave of Adullam, while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. At that time, David was in the stronghold, and the Philistines' garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three mighty men broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. Far be it from me, O Lord, to do this, he said. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives? and David would not drink it. Such were the exploits of the three mighty men. Abishai, the brother of Joab, son of Zeruah, was chief of the three. He raised his spear against three hundred men whom he killed, and so he became as famous as the three. Was he not held in greater honour than the three? He became their commander, even though he was not included among them. Benahai, son of Jehoiada, was a valiant fighter from Kabzeel, who performed great exploits. He struck down two of Moab's best men, 
He also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. And he struck down a huge Egyptian. Although the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benaiah stood against him with a club. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Such were the exploits of Benaiah, son of Jehoiada. He, too, was as famous as the three mighty men. He was held in greater honour than any of the thirty, but he was not included among the three, and David put him in charge of his bodyguard. Among the thirty were Asahel, the brother of Joab, Elhanan, son of Dodo from Bethlehem, Shammah the Herodite, Elikah the Herodite, Helez the Palite, Ira the son of Ikesh from Tekoa, Abizar from Anathoth, Mebunai the Hushite, Salmon the Ahite, Maharai the Netophahite, Heled son of Bana the Netophahite, Ittai son of Ribai from Gilead in Benjamin, Beniah the Pyranothanite, Hidai from the ravines of Gash, Abi Albon the Arabith, Azamoth the Bachumite, Eliahab the Shavanite, the sons of Jeshan, Jonathan the son of Shammah the Hararite, Aham the son of Shara the Hararite, Eliphat son of Ahashai the Machathite, Eliam the son of Ahithotel the Gileonite, Hezro the Carmelite, Para the Arbite, Igal son of Nathan from Zoba, the son of Hagri, Zelek the Ammonite, Nahare the Berathite, the armor-bearer of Joab, son of Zeruai, Ira the Ithrite, Garab the Ithrite, and Uriah the Hittite. They were thirty-seven in all. Again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go and take a census of Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab and the army commanders with him, Go throughout the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and enroll the fighting men so that I may know how many there are. Joab replied to the king, May the Lord your God multiply the troops a hundred times over and may the eyes of my lord the king see it. Why does my lord the king want to do such a thing? King's word, however, overruled Joab and the army commanders. So they left the presence of the king to enroll the fighting men of Israel. After crossing the Jordan, they camped near Aroa, south of the town in the gorge, and then went through Gad and on to Jaza. They went to Gilead and the region of Trachim, Hodshi, and on to Danjan, around towards Sidon. Then they went towards the fortress of Tyre, and all the towns of the Hivites and Canaanites, and finally they went on to Beersheba, to the Negev of Judah. After they had gone through the entire land, they came back to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. Joab reported the number of the fighting men to the king in Israel. There were 800,000 able-bodied men who could handle the sword, and in Judah, 500,000. David was conscience-stricken after he had counted the fighting men, and he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, O Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very selfish thing. Before David got up the next morning, the word of the Lord had come to Gad the prophet, David's seer. Go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I'm giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. So Gad went to David and said to him, Shall there come upon you three years of famine in your land, or three months of fleeing from your enemies while they pursue you, or three days of plague in your land? Now then, think it over and decide how I should answer the one who sent me. David said to Gad, I am in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But do not let me fall into the hands of men. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel 
from that morning until the end of the time designated, and seventy thousand of the people from Dan to Beersheba died. When the angel stretched out his hand to destroy Jerusalem, the Lord was grieved because of the calamity, and said to the angel who was afflicting the people, Enough! Withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was then at the threshing floor of Arunai the Jebusite. When David saw the angel who was striking down the people, he said to the Lord, I am the one who has sinned and done wrong. They, these are but sheep. What have they done? Let your hand fall upon me and my family. On that day, Gad went to David and said to him, Get up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aranah the Jebusite. So David went up as the Lord had commanded through Gad. When Aranor looked and saw the king and his men coming towards him, he went out and bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. Aranor said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? Buy your threshing floor, David answered, so that I can build an altar to the Lord, so that the plague on the people may be stopped. Aranor said to David, let my lord the king take whatever pleases him and offer it up. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering, and here are the threshing sledges and ox yokes for the wood. O king, Aranor gives all this to the king. Aranor also said to him, May the lord your God accept you. But the king replied to Aranor, No, I insist on paying you for it, I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid fifty shekels of silver for them. David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. And the Lord answered prayer on behalf of the land and the plague on Israel was stopped. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarrelling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned each to his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it. But God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labour. For we are co-workers in God's service, you are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that your cells are God's temple, and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you shall become fools, so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness, and again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or present, or the future. All are yours, and you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. For more resources to help you bring the word to life, 
Go to premier.org.uk slash Bible. This reading has been taken from the NIV Bible Biblica and is published by Hodder and Stoughton.